Oops. Go back. There we go. Okay, good morning, everyone, and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I am your host, Krista Burns, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Uh, Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly online event. Um, we're a webinar, we're a webcast, uh, we're an online show. Uh, there is lots of discussion about which of those terms are appropriate or even acceptable. Uh, we don't care what you call us. We're here live, online, every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time. So join us here. We are The show is free and open to anyone to watch. So definitely care, share with any of your colleagues out there. Um, as are our recordings. Uh, every week the show is recorded and posted to our website that I'll show you at the end so you can see there. So if you're unable to join us on Wednesday mornings at 10 a.m., that's fine. You can always come back whenever you do have time, when it's convenient for you, and watch our recordings. We post the recordings, PowerPoint presentations, um, links to any websites that are mentioned, hopefully everything you'd need to get you know, the full information about the show. And we do a mixture of things here on the show, uh, interviews, book reviews, mini training sessions, demos. Uh, basically, our criteria is, um, is it library related? We'll have it on the show. We're pretty open. Um, and any type of library out there, we've had all across the board. Um, we have uh, Nebraska Library Commission staff sometimes do sessions, and we also bring in guest speakers sometimes, as we have now. Um, this morning, to my left, is um, Phil Hendrickson. He's the director at the Link Library at Concordia University mm -hmm. um, out in Seward, so just west of us, just a little bit. About a half hour? About a half hour, yeah, not bad, just outside Lincoln. So, um, and I saw that he had done this presentation at a spring meeting, I think it was, mm -hmm. um, for our uh, college and university section. Right. Um, did actually a combo meeting with the Kansas um, Library Association's college and university section, and... Um, I was just perusing their agenda of things, and this one jumped out at me as a really cool program, and I know many libraries are doing this kind of things, both academic and public, um, and so I invited uh, Phil to come on and uh, share with us what he had done at the meeting here. So um, I'm just going to hand it over to you. If you want to, you can use either the keyboard or the mouse, and um, for you to take it away. Very good. Well, thanks for That's having everything me. we need to know about games. <laughs> Great. Great. Well, this is uh, a timely topic because in the gaming sub-community, if you will, it's sort of a, a buzz question right now is, has gaming gone mainstream? Now, in the public, that question would elicit snickers because people think gaming, they think video gaming. Ah, no. But we're talking about board games and, mm -hmm. and tabletop games. Right. So more on that terminology in a minute. But... It's appearing in more and more places. You'll see popular TV shows that'll have, you know, a board game laid out, and it's mm -hmm. not just Clue or Monopoly or Candyland anymore that mm -hmm. you're used to. So, um, we'll refer to the fact that we're in what we call a renaissance of board games, and I mean, yeah, yeah, that's mm -hmm. it's interesting so because of the hundreds of new ones that are coming out every year but most people don't hear about them. And so that's a little bit about what we're gonna talk about today is what's going on there and what are we doing with it in our library? Mm -hmm. So uh, this was a, a Wall Street Journal article during the last Super Bowl, January of this year. There was a little bit of a, or during the playoffs, there was a, an article in there about the Green Bay Packers playing Settlers of Catan. Really? And, and having a regular that. game night, uh, a few of the players, one in particular, were aficionados of the game, and they developed a, a group that loved to play this game. Hmm. Uh, Sailors of Catan is sort of the poster child for these newer style of games. It uh, came out in Germany in 1995, came to uh, the U.S. and in an English translation in 96, and really sort of took the world by storm. But you still won't find it in Walmart because it's not a mass market, mm. sort of popular level game mm. like that. Uh, but anyway, it was sort of news that the Packers were playing it uh, because this is not something you'd necessarily expect. No. Out of a team of football players, especially the linemen, the, the big linemen <laughs> who are the ones who were, who were playing it the most. Um, but if we say we don't expect them to play that, then we're stereotyping them as being sort of big brutes. That's mm. not true. You know, they're very smart as well, and these are strategy games and such. But anyway, uh, moving on a little bit, when we talk about board games, we often think of the things that we played as children. 
Now, some of us were children longer ago <laughs> uh, than others, but it's pretty common to think of Monopoly mm -hmm. as sort of you know, the most well-known board game probably that a lot at our in house, the world. Yeah. Uh, not of all time. Obviously, things like chess, and checkers, Go, mm -hmm. and and things in different parts of the world were around far longer. But Monopoly really has been around. Uh, the design dates back to when the Model T was also designed. Mm -hmm. And if you think about it, that's there's been a lot of changes in automobiles since the Model T. So what about board games? Why do we still think of Monopoly and a game that's designed that long ago? So today's games look quite a bit different. Oh yeah, have so much stuff. a lot of different stuff going on. So this is one of my favorite new ones to show graphically. It's called Rococo, hmm. and it's about the um, the court of King Louis the Fifteenth, and oh. the, and the players are actually owners of dressmaking firms. Okay. You're making the suits and the dresses that the gentlemen and ladies wear to the ball mm -hmm. at the court of the king. Not a typical topic that you think of <laughs> for board games. No, not something people have maybe off the top of their head say, oh, I'm interested in that either. Yeah, but I'm going to be a dressmaker. <laughs> <laughs> but when, if it makes, if the gaming aspect of it is interesting, what the topic is maybe isn't important that it's relevant or interesting to you. Right. And there are so many different themes mm -hmm. these days. Obviously, everything from dressmaking <laughs> to there's umpteen zombie games oh, yeah. to all sorts of different strategy things. Um, trading in the Mediterranean is, is a catchphrase used for uh, quite a few of these games that were developed out of Europe. Um, but uh, we're getting ahead of ourselves just a little bit. I'm going to mention a little bit of terminology here that these games are known by. When you think back in how games were played, at least in American culture, there was a common term, parlor games. Hmm. And parlor games were things like Monopoly or other types of games that you would play on a table or card games. You know, back in the day, just about every family, probably depending on what part of the country you grew up in, had a game, Pinochle or Euchre or mm -hmm. 500 or Pitch or whatever, that was the common family game to play. And there was sort of a rite of passage when children were old enough to sit on your dad's lap and learn the game, and then when you actually got to play with the adults, um, that was that was quite a thing. I remember that. Mm -hmm. See, I was I grew up in a euchre family, and my wife grew up in a pinochle family, so oh. we're a mixed marriage. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so that was kind of a thing in our in our past, and that has seemed to fade away, not entirely, and still in certain parts of the country. Obviously, those traditional games and card games are still being played. But that concept of sitting around the family game table had, had maybe waned some, especially with the rise of video games. Mm -hmm. They got the attention of children um, and just gave them something to sit at and do for hours and hours. But it's starting to come back. Mm -hmm. And that's sort of why we're on this topic today. Now, we'll use the terms board and card games, and that's just obvious if it's got a board and it's on the table. It's a board mm -hmm. game uh, or a card game. Those are pretty well known. Some people use the term tabletop games. Mm -hmm. Anything that's on yeah. anything that's on a table, because that can also encompass uh, role-playing games, mm -hmm. uh, games with lots of little miniatures, and, and that sort of thing. Other types of things. Um, the terms hobby games or modern games are sometimes mm -hmm. used to differentiate and say, no, when I say board games, I'm not talking about Candyland or mm -hmm. Sorry. <laughs> I'm talking about new stuff, and if you're not familiar with that, then let me uh, explain. Sometimes they're called designer games, and as you can see in the in the picture there, that's because the name of the designer is right on the box. When you mm -hmm. get those long flat boxes of games uh, in Walmart, you typically don't see a designer credited on the, the game. It's the company right. that makes Hasbro, it. Hasbro, Parker yeah. Brothers, those mm -hmm. sorts of things. Well, in the new in the new era of modern games, people will follow game designers like they mm -hmm. follow authors. So if you've got yeah. favorite authors that you'd like to read and they come out with a new book, you pay attention. Mm -hmm. It's the same way with designers. So Ticket to Ride is one of the most popular board games of the modern era. Yes. 
and its designer, Alan Moon, has become kind of a rock star. <laughs> uh, so at gaming conventions, he'll be mobbed when he walks out, or maybe mobbed is the wrong word, but well-recognized, often asked for autographs or things like that. And when he comes out with a new game, people pay attention because they know they like his previous work. Right. So it's a similar thing. Now, also, would that also go along with, because I've paid attention to certain, all these new independent gaming companies that come out with various types of games. I've kind of noticed I like this game from this company, and I went to their website and said, yeah. oh, there's that other cool one, too, that's a totally yeah. different style. So I've kind of done that kind of thing as well, that the, yeah. the new com smaller companies are something I follow. <laughs> and that is very true. Sort of like, as librarians, sometimes we will follow publishers. Mm -hmm. And we'll be very mm -hmm. familiar with, this publisher does this sort of work. Mm -hmm. They maybe have a certain bias or whatever, but they, or maybe not. And they're known for different things. Mm -hmm. That's very true right. of the publishers as well. And the game publishers are, that we're talking about are small. Mm -hmm. Most of them are very small companies. There are only one or two that have grown sizable enough to really be t uh, noticed in the general marketplace. Mm -hmm. Most of these are small companies and the game runs, the print runs are say two to 5,000 copies. Mm -hmm. And then when that sells out over the course of two or three years, they judge its popularity and decide whether to reprint it. So these are obviously not being sold in Walmart. No. Because Walmart would buy <laughs> <laughs> too many. How many tens of thousands of copies of something if they think More it's More than they'd be sell. able to produce at the level right. they're at. Now a lot of these too, and I'm sure, I don't know if you're going to talk about um, Kickstarter and things like that, that mm -hmm. some of these games are. Yeah, that's a, that's a rising thing mm -hmm. and a little bit controversial, but True. as that's okay. It's a risk. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but yeah, a lot of the games that people design because sometimes these designers will come up with a game idea. Maybe they'll pitch it to some publishers and not succeed mm -hmm. in selling it. So they decide to go in and become a publisher mm -hmm. and sell it themselves. That's where, like you say, there's a risk involved because some of them have no idea what they're doing. Yeah. <laughs> and they'll try <laughs> to sell it through Kickstarter mm -hmm. and get in over their head becomes too popular and they can't handle all of the... Yeah. yeah, or they haven't done enough math mm -hmm. and they realize that they're actually losing money on every copy they sell instead of making mm -hmm. money and that sort of thing. Um, that's an interesting version, mm -hmm. <laughs> but, uh, but I don't tend to follow the Kickstarter ones very much. Now, you'll find some of the publishers are starting to use Kickstarter as a pre-order system. Oh, okay, cool. And that's also sort of controversial because people will say, oh, Kickstarter is supposed to be for the little guy oh, just, who's just trying to do their own project. Company, yeah. and, and the rebuttal is most of these companies are little guys. <laughs> they are. So yeah. It's Hasbro's not doing a Kickstarter. No. That's, <laughs> yeah. No, they're not. But, mm -hmm. but some moderately sized hobby game companies do use Kickstarter regularly. Um, so that is whatever you're comfortable with. Mm -hmm. That's fine. Now you'll see also in there the term Euro games, and we'll get into that um, in a little bit, but the concept is that the big movement to start what I'm calling a renaissance really grew out of Europe, hmm. and specifically Germany. Now it's a little broader than that, but in particular there's a, there's a strong history point hmm. in Germany that sort of triggered this, and so that's where the term Euro games come from. In fact, that's a broadening of what used to be called German games, you know, when yeah. I, we mentioned Settlers of Catan, and when mm -hmm. it came over in the 90s, it was referred to as one of these new German games. Mm -hmm. He said it had to be translated, so it yeah. was in German originally. Right, yeah. and so there were some of these publishing companies that got started by picking, going over to Europe, picking go good new game titles, mm -hmm. and then mm -hmm. signing a contract with the publisher to do the translation and import them mm -hmm. and, and sell them over here. Um, that's all gotten broader and, and not so specialized now in the uh, intervening decades. But uh, yeah, that's a little bit of an interesting global marketing mm -hmm. history. Um, I do have a question that came in, and you may get into this about how libraries can get a hold of these games, how they can buy yeah. them. Yeah, that's one of the games. things we'll get to. Okay, cool. Um, we'll get to that in a second, in a bit. <laughs> so, right, yeah. right. Yeah, that's that's collection development, mm -hmm. right? Yep. Mm -hmm. So there we go. Okay, so just to touch a little bit on what the values are in these board games and why we felt comfortable even bringing them into the library in the first place. Somebody might say, well, this is just for fun. Well, it is fun. 
and that's a big part of it. But there are plenty of other valuable uh, skills that you can develop out of these board games. I won't dwell on this. That's more of an education webinar, <laughs> if you will. But since we're not talking about simple games where you roll a pair of dice and just see what happens to you, these modern games are built upon usually an open decision set and a way that you're faced with a challenge, a problem, and you have to make decisions on how you're going to address that. Mm -hmm. So that's a lot more involving logic, problem-solving skills, communication skills. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of funny, too, a lot of them use subjects that we learn in school, geography and mm -hmm. you know, flora and fauna and biology and different things like that. But they're not designed as educational games. They don't promote themselves as they that. They don't promote yeah. themselves as that. Mm -hmm. And people who were used to the idea of educational games, things specifically designed for that purpose, typically those will say they were worksheets in a box, mm -hmm. you know, where you had specific learning goals in mind and you put some game mechanism onto it to help the kids not be quite as bored getting through it in right. class. But how many of those types of games would the kids go home at night and say, can we play this game? That's a difference here. The emphasis is on games that you want to play, and it's children and their parents, and it's fun to play them together. Mm -hmm. So that's what makes this a little bit different. It's a funny thing about Ticket to Ride. We talked about that earlier. That is played, the original game, on a map of the United States. Mm -hmm. It has railroad routes that cover the whole country. And they go from city to city. Well, to make the game work on the map, the designer had to move Duluth, Minnesota, <laughs> to a different spot uh -huh. that's not geographically accurate oh. to make the pieces fit on the board. And it was a game. <laughs> they designed it as a game. But it became so, so popular play. with teachers to use it as a fun thing to play, and oh, by the way, you're learning your geography, you're learning where Pocatello is or something like that, but we're not gonna you know, push that notion. But he got teachers writing to him saying, why did you put Duluth in the wrong place? Because now I can't use this in my class, especially teachers in Minnesota. Yeah. yeah. Um, but he had to say, it's a game. It was designed, you know. I didn't design it for that purpose, I'm sorry. Yeah, the, the 10th anniversary edition of that that just came out a uh, year or two ago, mm -hmm. last year maybe, is this beautiful new map. It's it's larger. It's got mm -hmm. interesting um, trains that have circus animals and all kinds mm -hmm. of fun stuff on it. And there's a little joke because on the map, it's still laid out the same way mm -hmm. as originally, but there's a little sign in a different spot that says, here lies the real Duluth. <laughs> okay. <laughs> as a nod to all those people that... Talk to him so about you that. can now use it. <laughs> yeah, teach. I suppose so. And you can you just teach, teach that. Well, sometimes you have to do things. Yeah, you have yeah. to adjust. And... Right. So the concept is we're having fun mm -hmm. and putting the use skills that we learn in class, but it's not intended as a teaching tool for that. Mm -hmm. Although there are some that are starting to do that, and mm -hmm. maybe we'll touch on that later. Now, as I said before, everybody knows how popular video games are. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that I like to point out is... As tabletop games are growing in popularity, this is one of the things I like to point out. Even when you play multiplayer video games, it's still mm -hmm. face to screen. Mm -hmm. There is a certain amount of, if you get together in a group, maybe some fist bumping or whatever, mm -hmm. but there's a whole different level of social interactivity when you're sitting around the table, handling the same cards and bits and chunks of wood and, mm -hmm. and that, you're looking somebody in the face, negotiating mm -hmm. with them, or communicating, we're trying to guess what they're going to do. Yeah, That's a whole other level of social interaction, mm -hmm. personally, than you get with video games. It really helps in It's those... a different kind of being social. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's the communication skills mm -hmm. um, and those subtle body cues and all that stuff mm -hmm. that you don't get in video games at all. Mm -hmm. you, your avatar doesn't read, you can't read <laughs> Avatar language the way you do body no. language. And even I when I can, we play video games in our house, next to each other on the couch, multiplayer, each with a controller, I'm still not looking at him. I have to watch the screen to see what's happening, and exactly. I can't see, oh, he, he's leaning this way, so he's going to go that way. I, 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 it's kind of hard to... Yeah. <laughs> we're still being social and doing it together, but it is a little different than looking him in the eye like a poker match, say, is he bluffing? Does he really have that card? You know. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Yeah. You even touch each other when you reach for the M&Ms at the same time. So, you know. <laughs> But uh, yeah, so okay, my one big tech screen 
Um, just some highlights about what we think we gain at the library by hosting game nights. We, uh, I'll go into the history in a bit, but we do have a monthly game night, mm -hmm. and that draws a lot of people into the library that otherwise wouldn't. Probably half of our attendees are not Concordia people. No, oh, so you're also so open to the public. We are open to yeah. the public, and we get a lot of people. We get a whole bunch of regulars from Lincoln. We mm -hmm. have people that come from Omaha, from Fremont, mm -hmm. from York, uh, all around in the region, mm -hmm. as far as an hour and a half away. And so that some of the things that we've noted that we like about game nights when we started doing this is, well, Seward's a small town. Mm -hmm. And so it wasn't a hard sell to the something administration so to say mm -hmm. it's something new to do. Mm -hmm. It's something different than the, than the, we have good sports, we have good mm -hmm. uh, rich arts activities and such on mm -hmm. our campus, but this is something different. Mm -hmm. uh, perhaps a different group of people, or it's more of an intellectual but fun mm -hmm. uh, activity. So it's not that now I have to ask, I know it's not something the public library is doing? At, well, they have some, and mm -hmm. my apologies to Becky <laughs> if, I, if I don't recall the exact details, but I know they did, um, they had a big Lego program. Oh, yeah, the, um, yeah, they've yeah. gotten into that, because there's the, the Lego, um, the building Lego, thing. yeah. Right. But, yeah. And there are certainly public libraries that are doing things, and in fact, uh, one of our regular attendees from Lincoln, mm -hmm. who comes to our game night, uh, and even demos games uh, for a game company, has started running a monthly game night game day, I should say, at the Isley branch of the public library Okay. Yeah. Uh, up on Superior Street. Mm -hmm. So it's, I believe, the last Sunday of every month, noon to six. So I come into town for that when mm -hmm. I can just come in and play and I don't have to be the host. But uh, that's one thing that's going on there. Mm -hmm. But that one is not run by the library staff. It's run by this patron oh, who uses, uses their the community room. They're... Oh, right. Mm -hmm. Right. Not to say it couldn't be mm -hmm. run by library staff like any other program. Yeah. Now, you'll find chess clubs throughout the country. Um, I'm not the one that – I haven't done the research on this myself, but I know Scott Nicholson writes about mm -hmm. that and how – I want to say it was in San Francisco, one of the oldest chess clubs, perhaps the oldest still extant mm -hmm. chess club in the country, is in the public library. It was a, it's been a service of their public library forever. Yeah, if you're big into wanting to know what's going on with libraries and board games, Scott Nicholson, he's he's the guy. Oh, he's the and I'll look guy. for his website and get some links up to that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah and I have one of his books later in my oh, bibliography cool. <laughs> page. So, yeah, it's really good. So another thing, obviously I mentioned our administration likes it when we draw visitors to campus. So that's one of the things we benefit by this. But I like the fact in the library that it gives me a chance to develop informal relationships with our students who come mm. and get to know them personally. And then later when they're working on a research project or something, they know me. And I might be walking through the library and they'll say, hey, Phil, can you help me find this or find out something about you know, the Renaissance or, or whatever uh, that they need to, to do research on because they know me personally. Mm. There is a reluctance on the part of researchers, uh, students in particular. They want to do it themselves, and they feel like if Google and Wikipedia can't lead them to where they're going, of course, that's a, it's a stereotype to say that, but it's fairly true. That's where they yeah. start. That's where yeah. they start. Whether we like it or not. And they don't know where to go next. Mm -hmm. And they have this reluctance mm -hmm. to talk to one of us adults and ask for help. Well, if they know me personally from game night, they're less reluctant to talk to me about it because they know I'm not going to you know, push them into stuff that I'm just, they see me as a friendly guy. So mm -hmm. they know they can talk to me. It also gives me a chance to talk, to make a point when prospective students are touring the campus with their parents and they're mm -hmm. passing through the library. And I use that as a talking point. I'll, I'll say the library is not for the sake of the books. It's for the sake of the students and the faculty and those who need information. And we, we try to stress that we're there to help them. But then we'll also make the point that by doing this monthly game night, we also like to have fun and we're approachable people. And it just mm -hmm. adds a level of humanity. Yeah. You know, a comfortableness. We're real people, really. Exactly. <laughs> Trying to build those relationships to our, to our library users. It's also an opportunity to draw into the library students who 
maybe otherwise would have even made a, a point of pride of saying, I made it through college without ever having to use the library. Um, <laughs> well, what's the point in that? Uh, yeah. You know, we know we're not their enemy, but I want them to feel comfortable coming in. So, yeah, we've had people off the wrestling team and, and other athletes and such come in and just get more comfortable being in the library space. And that's, that's I think, a cool thing. So, so I'm happy about that. Um, here's a shot, and you'll see several pictures from our game nights. This is the space where we do our, our game nights uh, once a month. Uh, the man that's waving there uh, at, right next to him in the red shirt is his daughter. And uh, we allow families to come to uh, any children that are old enough to be engaged in the games. We're not a babysitting service, so no. uh, they're responsible for managing their own children. You can see we have a snack bar down the side that we intentionally use the word snack potluck ah. so that we put okay. it on the attendees. Bring I'll provide food. coffee, you mm -hmm. know, a pot of coffee. I'll provide the paper goods. But we leave it to the attendees to bring in snacks and things like that. And that creates a sense of community mm -hmm. when they come in. So and that helps a lot of people I know who are trying to arrange these things with budget. <laughs> How much does it cost to pull off one of these things? Exactly. Exactly. So I'm not spending probably more than $10 mm -hmm. each time, if that, mm -hmm. for the paper goods and such. And I really like that community idea. Yeah. yeah. Like they are cre helping create it. Exactly. Exactly. I don't know if you can see it well enough, but down in the bottom of the picture, we have a little sign-in table there mm -hmm. just for attendance purposes. And I always promise people I'm not going to spam you with anything. <laughs> just, just sign in so I get a count. But we've got little green and orange signs that say uh, players wanted and teacher wanted. Oh, and when nice. people get out a game that they're not familiar with, which is often the case, mm -hmm. they can put out a sign that says, we'd like somebody to teach us this game. There's this constant culture of teaching and learning with the new board games because, as I said before, there are hundreds and hundreds of them coming out every year. And even those of us who are aficionados, who pay attention to the online sites and who are really with it, we're always looking to learn new games. And, yeah, there, it's you can't just necessarily jump in, even if you've played other games. They're all so being... being they're all so different now. I mean, the basics and the things you got to know, yeah. Yeah, there are differences and wide variety of styles and subject mm -hmm. matter. We talked about um, subjects before, but some of them are very simple. Two or three very simple rules that just work together well to create an interesting game environment. Some of them are complex, you know, high, highly complex strategy games. And everybody gets to their level of comfort with what's your favorite style of game. What ones do you like the best? Mm -hmm. So there really is something for everything, everyone in these. Um, and on that, I want to touch a little bit, give just a little bit of the backstory here of what makes this a game renaissance. Now, in this picture, I've, I've picked these four games from our library collection intentionally because you can see on the cover of some of them this red sort of pawn-shaped thing with little wings on it. That is a prize. That's the Spiel des Jahres. Mm -hmm. And this is kind of where our history uh, gets interesting of these games. If you think back to the mid 20th century, in America, we had just won two world wars, as we would say it, <laughs> with our national pride. And so g coming out with a new game like Risk, where you're trying to take over the world, made sense. We were mm -hmm. proud of that. Toys like G.I. Joe, where you could play with and, sure. and play, you know, dart guns, whatever, any of that stuff. We were okay with that and for our children because we had this pride in what our country had accomplished. Over in Germany, they had just lost two world wars. Mm -hmm. Their country was devastated by it. They're almost laid waste, really. They had to rebuild from ashes, quite literally. They didn't want anything to do with military type toys or games. Now Germany had a long history of being of excellent toy makers mm -hmm. and having quality things for their children to do. But they intentionally as a society said, we are going to impose limits. They actually passed laws that toys could not be militaristic, that they could not have Nazi symbolism 
or things like that. Um, so they forced uh, designers and, and companies to say, what can we do differently to make toys that we like our children to play with, that right. we like our families to be involved in? What new subjects can we deal with? Well, as they did that, and because they obviously had a history of toys and, and games and such, they actually have press, they have journalists that specialize in writing about games, toys, things like that. So some members of this, of the press who were specialists in games came up with this award and they simply called it Spiel des Jahres, which is the German for game of the year. Yeah. Very simple title. <laughs> and there was no money awarded with the award but it started in 1979, the first awards were given. But what happens is when this award is put on a game, or even the nominees, but in particular the one that wins it, the publishers and designer know that when that pawn is on their game, it will sell anywhere from 10 to 100 times as many copies, maybe even more. So that's the financial incentive. Mm -hmm. And I've sales. never heard of it before, but I buy board games. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's it's but, a German game yeah, of the year. Okay. Yeah. And so, but their intention as a committee is to pick games that promote family game time. Mm -hmm. So they like games that work well at a family level, that children, say middle school and up, can enjoy, can understand, and participate fully in, and yet are fun enough that their parents like to play it with them. You know, what parent likes to play Candyland? You do it because you want to spend time with your children, and we understand mm -hmm. that. But the game itself, ugh, you know. I don't, but the games that are that are promoted by Spiel des Jahres, the games themselves are good and are interesting enough for adults to enjoy together with their children. And in recent mm -hmm. years, they've branched out to have two more awards: the Kinderspiel des Jahres, which is specifically for children's games. Mm -hmm. So those are games that are even for younger children but still very good and quality games. And then the Kennerspiel, which is a little more complicated, a little more complex, still not off the deep end of the pool, <laughs> yeah. but a little more complex than the Spiel des Jahres. So, yeah, with that history in mind, the games started getting better, and it, was, it created a snowball effect. So the, the awards started in the late 70s, mm -hmm. and then as we got through, through the 80s, better games were being developed, and the bar just kept ri rising year by year, to where you get to the mid-90s, and then you get Settlers of Catan, and that one really became a watershed. Mm -hmm. People who were, like military people stationed over there would play it, or people who had traveled over there to visit friends played it, and would buy a copy and bring it back, and teach it to their friends. And it caught on really quickly. Yeah. And within a year, they, they found a publisher over here that wanted to bring it over here, and create an English edition, sell it, and it's it's been huge. So it has sold, Catan with all of its subparts and, and spin-offs and such have, mm -hmm. have sold over 30 million units worldwide, and it's published in 30 languages around the world. So that one really has become the poster child for how games developed in Germany and then became a worldwide phenomenon. Mm -hmm. Now that's mid-90s, so that's literally 20 years ago now Yeah. from when it came out in Germany. So we've advanced and continued that snowball has continued to grow through the years to, to great stuff. So what's different between those games and the Monopoly, the Sari, and so on? When you put one of those games from Walmart on your table and you look at the components and, and the flimsy money or the little pieces mm -hmm. and so on and, and the cheap cards, you know it's a children's toy. Mm -hmm. You can tell just by looking at it. The new games have components made of wood, um, fashion oh, plastic that are really nice. I've resin. been very impressed with some that I've bought and you open it up and you expect the plastic pieces and they're not. They're made out of actual wood, not yeah. like wood looking stuff or anything. It's Yeah, it's pretty amazing. Right. And then I know well, that's why it costs so much. I guess it's okay. <laughs> that is true. There is they a, are pricier. Yeah. They are. They are. Mm -hmm. Two or three times as much. Mm -hmm. But it's worth it because mm -hmm. you're getting stuff so. that you'll play for years. You don't just play it for a couple years with your kids until they outgrow it. Right. Because you'll keep playing these games after the kids go to bed <laughs> or when they move out, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but often, especially games at the Spiel des Jahres level or even the Kenner Spiel, they're easy to learn. They're not mm -hmm. a huge rule book. Some of the military history and simulation games that were popular 
in American hobby culture in the 70s and so on would literally have big thick rule books, maybe you know inch, inch and a half thick, that you'd have to wade through and all the little sub point two point one point six D F when <laughs> such and such occurs, if this and that. These games aren't like that. No. They have a simple rule book, usually full of pictures that help mm -hmm. you understand what to do. They're they're much easier to learn and get into. Now the deep ones still exist. Mm -hmm. And some of them are, are getting a lot better as well. But it's very easy to get into this with, with games that have rule books no more than four pages, six pages. Mm -hmm. Good stuff. And they're fun. The game on the left there is called Takanoko. And it the theme is that China has given one of its prized pandas to the emperor of Japan. Mm -hmm. And it's just darling. If you've ever it. seen it, I've seen. I want it. I haven't gotten it yet, but I really yeah. want it. Yeah. <laughs> I always tell people it wins the cute award because it it's got this darling little panda and this darling little farmer that you move around the board, growing bamboo, eating bamboo, and that it's it's a great one to introduce to people, and it's easy to learn mm -hmm. and fun and very colorful. Children love it. Adults love it. Yeah. So beyond that, what was one of the key complaints people have about games like Monopoly, Risk, um, some of the old games? Is they could go on forever, yeah, ad nauseum. Now, part of that was because of house rules and so on, but still, epic sessions of risk that take all weekend or whatever, and then still don't end. Yeah, we've <laughs> played in the years of like Trivial Pursuit can sometimes go on forever. Oh, and we yeah. just said, you know what? Let's just end now. Right. Whoever's got the most pieces, that's the winner because we just can't anymore. Yeah. <laughs> it's taken so long. Yeah. Indeed. Well, the design of many of these modern games. Most of them, in fact, have a definite length. Mm -hmm. They'll target 60 minutes or 45 minutes or 90 minutes, depending on their target audience. But that's a specific thing where it's often a collection of points mm -hmm. or a race to certain achievements. It's not about eliminating all the other players, like you yeah. have to in Monopoly Risk or some of those. And I like, I've noticed, because I've paid attention, on the boxes it tells you that, how, about how long it will take to play one session of the game. Exactly. Um, I usually say, add in another half hour, at least that first time. When you're trying to learn it, trying yeah. Trying to learn it. Mm -hmm. And then you'll feel comfortable after that, deciding how long does the game really take. Mm -hmm. um, a lot more player interaction and meaningful decisions. That's the key. It's not about, as I say, flipping a card, rolling dice, and finding out what happens to you. Um, a little bit of that, maybe in some of the games, but almost never do you do something like that and move around a track and just see what happens. Mm -hmm. That's gone. It's all about open-ended decisions. And that can be intimidating the first time you try to play one of these modern games. Mm -hmm. you know, when you sit down at the game and people say, what do I do? And you say, well, you've got this and this and this. You've got all these choices. Yeah. So pick something to do. Well, what should I do? Well, pick something. <laughs> and you might need to negotiate to the, with the person next to you to figure out, well, if you're going to do that, I'm going to try this or... Right. Yeah. Yeah, but they're meaningful decisions, mm -hmm. and that's what drives the games. That's what makes them strategy games rather than just games of luck and chance. So, um, right. So, on to a little bit about what our game nights are like at Concordia. Now, I said that these are once a month. The history started a little over two years ago, 2013, mm -hmm. April. Now, our family was already a fan of these games and we would play them at home with the kids and with our friends mm -hmm. and we become sort of evangelists as is common with fans of these games. You tend to have to introduce them to people to get more players. With a video game you can just go online and find another player mm -hmm. but with board games you need three, four people sitting around the table to play it with you mm -hmm. and so you look for other people who uh, aren't going to think you're weird. <laughs> If you say, let's play a board game, mm -hmm. <laughs> and you sort of find out, you learn to read people. Yeah. And say, who can I introduce these to, and they won't think I'm strange. Um, but, so doing that, we started with Game Nights at Home, and we would get students coming from Concordia, friends from church or whatever, and they grew too big for our house. We could have <laughs> three tables set up, we can have about 15 people playing in our hall, and they just got too big. And it finally occurred to me one night, hey, I'm a library director. I've got a key to the library. <laughs> and we've got space with lots of tables, mm -hmm. good lighting. That's where you start. Mm -hmm. Do you have good open tables? The larger, the better, but, mm -hmm. but good open tables and light. 
This is not like in a bar where you like soft lighting or anything no. like that. You like good lighting so you can see the pieces, just know what you're doing. That's about all you need to start is a willingness to let people in and tables and lighting, mm -hmm. of course, bathrooms, <laughs> all the stuff that libraries have. So our library closes at five on Fridays and Saturdays. Ah, there you go. Yeah. So for us, it was really easy. I could say, well, we'll do it on Saturday night after we close. So we go from 6 to midnight, mm -hmm. Saturday nights, mm -hmm. and I set up a few extra tables up front, the ones that you can see on an angle up there, so that people who bring their own games to share have a place mm -hmm. to set them up and, and spread them out. Um, there's some tables, old index tables, that yeah. we no longer have the indexes right. on, that I use to put the library game collection on. So that's a permanent location right near here. And people just come in and game. Uh, we set up the, the snack potluck down the side, have them sign in. And like I said before, about half of the attendees have no direct connection to Concordia. Uh, we think that's pretty cool. Nice, yeah. Now, one of the real benefits is we have some avid gamers from Lincoln, mm -hmm. from York, that come and join us, and they're ready teachers. Mm -hmm. So the fact that we're dealing with all mm -hmm. these new games uh, or new to people who haven't played them before, that's okay because we have people who are willing and ready to teach them. And that's a fun thing that uh, I get involved in as well. So we're often teaching people new games and then turning around and learning new games ourselves. So that's a lot of fun. We are trying to do a better job of connecting with faculty. Because one of the other goals that I have for this collection is knowing that these games have a purpose in the classroom and that Concordia grew up as a teacher's college. So probably close to half of our student body are going to be future teachers. Mm -hmm. I want them to be exposed to this new medium that can be used in their classroom that can provide fun ways for their kids to exercise the skills they're learning in class. And so I'm, I'm trying to get inroads to the faculty um, to get them involved a little bit. Had some success, had a few faculty that have come, um, even brought their children and so on. Um, and step by step, we're getting there. Mm -hmm. um, it's been growing more as an event than specifically on the educational goals, but we're making progress um, a little bit at a time. We kind of sneak it in there. <laughs> we do. And it's really interesting because that's also a growing use in the gaming community. There are growing connections in how they're being used in education. In fact, I brought a book along to show you. It's part of a series by Rosen Publishing on teaching different subjects through play. And in the series, they have five books to start with. They'll take specific board games and give actual lesson plans for how you would use this game in the classroom to teach. Nice. The one that I brought along is called Teaching the Underground Railroad mm -hmm. Through Play. Now, that might not be the first subject that you think of to have a fun game about the Underground Railroad. Well, let me tell you, I'll just briefly show it. We don't really even have to zoom in. But for people who are interested in that subject matter, this game is incredible. It's called Freedom the Underground Railroad, and the designer, Brian Meyer, mm -hmm. is a librarian. Nice. Go figure. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. This is one of those new cooperative games. Now, I that's was wondering a, if you're going to, yeah. Yes, that's we a style a of game of that, that yeah. has come out in the last, say, 10 years in the board gaming environment. In cooperative games, the players do not compete against each other. Mm -hmm. They compete against the mechanism of the game to win or lose as a team. And when Brian Meyer was trying to work with this subject matter of the Underground Railroad and build a game on it, he knew nobody's going to want to play the bad guys. Nobody's going to want to play the slave catchers, the yeah. people who are doing <laughs> things that we have, you know, in our historical perspective, realized were wrong. They didn't feel wrong at the time, but we don't want to put ourselves in those roles. So instead, the game mechanisms play that role have the slave catchers moving across the board in certain methods based upon what you do. And your role in the game as players are uh, to, is to get slaves, the pieces that represent the slaves, from plantations in the south through the northern states and up into Canada. 
-hmm. where they'll be free. And you have to try to do that within a certain amount of time and get a certain number of them up to freedom without losing too many back to the slave market or to getting caught. Um, and it's an interesting, challenging mechanism. You also have to raise funds and raise uh, political support mm -hmm. through the game as you're doing it. And there are a whole bunch of cards in the game that are historic people and historic events. And as you see the card, it might be John Brown, or it might be Lincoln, or it might be the Emancipation Proclamation, or just different things, many that I had never heard of until getting out the game. And so you're learning those bits of historical context for how things worked and different roles that people played in that process. Um, it adds a richness, a depth, that just reading the stories, mm -hmm. reading about it in your history textbook Is doesn't, yeah. doesn't convey. Um, we do have a question about that. and. Well, the question starts up more broad. What ages are these games appropriate for? And I guess it's going to vary, but specifically that Underground Railroad one. Yeah. Does it... Let's check what do they the say? box. <laughs> it says... Oh, ages, ages 13, 13 and, up. and up. Yeah, this one says, says 13 one. and up. And that may be based on both the content and the complexity of the gameplay? Or... Yeah, that is, that is true. Because in that one, it's a little bit sensitive. Actually... Mm -hmm. It's a little bit intense when you play it because there are the times topic, yeah. as you're moving these slaves up to freedom where you might say to get these four up through wherever, Chicago, to freedom, I'm going to have to let this one over in D.C. get captured. Um, that's harsh, yeah. And that's harsh to make those decisions. Mm -hmm. And when you embody the subject matter of the game, mm -hmm. then you're thinking, I just let a person die or let a person back get captured slavery. and be put back into slavery. Mm -hmm. But it was for the greater mm -hmm. good of having these mm -hmm. four or six or whatever. You have to weigh those decisions. And that would be tough for young children. Yeah. So on the boxes, they'll have both number of players about length of time and ages. And that right. rail underground railroad one specifically says 13 and up. Yeah. 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 And parents who play these games with their children will get a sense for what games after you've played a few, it's like, well, yeah, my kid is nine, but he gets it. Right, and yes. he, he can understand these things, and we can play together. And then it's just a matter of subject matter and other things like that. So, yeah, very very interesting <laughs> yeah. Um, opportunities. That really wide age range. Mm -hmm. There's a uh, company called Haba, and their games are very recognizable because they're bright yellow boxes with bright red letters, H-A-B-A. -A. It's a German company. Mm -hmm. They make toys, they make games, they make children's furniture. They even have their own little resort. <laughs> they're really a, a family entertainment company in Germany. But their games are well known worldwide for being excellently made, lots of big chunky wooden components mm -hmm. and such. And interesting for children and interesting enough for the parents to want to play them with the kids. Mm -hmm. Their games are designed more for younger children, you know, even ages two and up, mm -hmm. depending on the game, but even so there. Uh, but they're more interesting mm -hmm. than Hi Ho Cherio. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's just how it is. So, and they're fun to look at too. Like I said, big, mm -hmm. colorful, the chunky big, wooden pieces yeah. that are fun to handle. The kids are going to like that, yeah. Right. Um, we do have another question about mm -hmm. what kinds of games you allow. Uh, do you allow loud games where people yell and shout out answers and guesses? I suppose if it's after hours. That's the key for us. Yeah. Is our game night is after hours. So that's what I was wondering about earlier, and I was waiting to see if you get to it, that it doesn't um, bother the people who are actually trying to study. Right. <laughs> um, right. So you can have anything as loud as you want in there at that, at that time. Yeah, at that time we can. Yeah. Now, are the space that we have, there's no way to enclose it. For obviously, yeah, you don't have a separate room that you use right. for it. Yeah. If you were doing a library gaming event mm -hmm. in a public library in a community room that right. has a door, mm -hmm. you know, you can let them, let them go, mm -hmm. have fun. Yeah. I don't specifically limit what games people bring. Mm -hmm. We don't have any electronic stuff set up. Yeah. So if anybody well, even specifically asks, specifically board game, right? right. Yeah. If anybody asks about video games, they ask about we just don't know or there. something, so it wouldn't be right. that kind of game. You could. You could. But... And we have some extra lounge spaces that aren't far away mm -hmm. from this space. So if a group wanted to do a game that's a little bit more socially interactive, mm -hmm. you know, we can let them have a space that's a little bit aside, but mm -hmm. still not out 
of right. the area. Right, because you don't want them running crazy all over the library where you can't monitor. <laughs> exactly. I don't even turn on the lights upstairs and downstairs, yeah. you know, certain areas. Mm -hmm. And the group is fairly self-policing. Usually that's the case, yeah. Yeah. So we, we had an incident uh, within the first year. When we first started doing these game nights, both my sons were still in high school. One of them is now a student at Concordia. But one of them that's an avid gamer was bringing a few friends from high school, inviting them to come. Mm -hmm. And we had an incident one night where they came, got out a couple of games, played a couple of things, and then left. And as mm -hmm. high schoolers will do, well, that's fine. It's open house style. Mm -hmm. But they left their snack trash all over and yeah. on the floor. They left the game pieces <laughs> out and so on. So when they came back the next time, I just talked to them and I said, you're welcome and we're happy to have you here. But this is an adult style event. It's not a party. Mm -hmm. So we expect people to clean up after themselves and to pick the game pieces back up in the box mm -hmm. and put them back on in the, the game area when you're done. Mm -hmm. But we are glad to have you here. Mm -hmm. And they have come back a future times. Mm -hmm. so I didn't scare them away. <laughs> nope. But we want them to understand that they need to be sort of self-policing in that regard. And then they're welcome to come and play. Mm -hmm. So so we like that. So that, that's something actually, it's interesting that you've got all ages here because someone did comment earlier and when I'd asked about does the public library do this kind of thing, someone said that at a public library it would generally be viewed as something for teens or younger to do. Um, which is maybe true, it depends on who you market it to and what you're doing. I mean, right. the game nights that are being done at Isley, is that similar to this where it's any all age type thing? All ages are welcome. Mm -hmm. We have not had very many um, unexpected guests, I'll say, <laughs> come in. We've had a, a couple. We've mm -hmm. had a few. Uh, there's a, uh, a lady and her, and her younger son that have come in a couple mm -hmm. of times, a couple of months, and just some other people. But because it's in its own room, right. closed off, it's not yes. so obvious. Mm -hmm. And I'm not trying to denigrate the library staff in any way, but it's not a library event. Right, so I don't true. think the library promotes it. I think it's mm -hmm. left up to the host of the event so it's to do his promotion. It happens, happens to be being done at the library. Exactly. Which, there's many people that do use the library community rooms for all sorts of things. Yeah. Right. True. Yeah. And so he promotes it through the channels he's familiar with, his own mm -hmm. Facebook account mm -hmm. and Board Game Geek, which I'll get yes. to in a minute. In fact, that's coming up next. Yeah. <clears throat> so through gaming channels, when you advertise it, you get other gamers. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so that's the primary attendees at that event. So it's going to depend but on those who's are adults. It. Yeah. Yeah. So this one would be adults at Isley because of where it's coming through. Right. But if the public library and that's not something we're getting today, this is about an academic, but in a that's future okay. show, I've got plans. <laughs> I've got yeah. things in the works. Um, it would depend on who's running it. Is it somebody coming in from the outside with their particular area, or is it the public yeah. library, either the teen librarian, the children's, or an adult? Right. Adult board gaming run by public libraries is a thing. Yeah, it is. And my key uh, suggestion on that is to connect through Board Game Geek mm -hmm. or meet up or through your local game shop, mm -hmm. connect with your local adult gamers. Right. They love to find new opportunities to play, especially mm -hmm. if your tables are large mm -hmm. and your lighting's good, if you're not charging them to come. Yeah. Those are key things that that's all they're looking for mm -hmm. is a place to do that and not have any guilt laid on them. You know, <laughs> yeah. if you play at a, at a game shop, there's sort of an implied, well, then buy a game or two here. It, you know? it varies, yeah. Which is true, and, and that's mm -hmm. fine because it is a store after all. Mm -hmm. But get them involved, and they will spread the word mm -hmm. through the gaming community, and they will be there to teach games. Right. Which is huge. Mm -hmm. Which is huge. There's actually a game shop here in Lincoln that we've gone to every now and then um, where um, they're actually very friendly and don't push this. They, they have a huge collection of board games that are available for people to play. And then people do bring in their own. And there's all sorts of strangers getting together and learning and just kind of looking over their shoulders at something saying, what is that? And yeah. every, this place, it, it, not every game shop is going to be this. I've heard about some that are not so. They're very clicky. But this one, and they think, come on, sit down. We'll show you how to play. Hi, my name's Bob. Hi, I'm, I'm Susan. And yeah. Right. But, you know, it'll vary. Right. And that, <laughs> this is an interesting stereotype of gamers, mm -hmm. especially the adult gamers, are often people who maybe dabbled in it 
mm-hmm. as a kid, at least the ones that have been gamers for a while. Maybe we dabbled in Dungeons and Dragons in high school, mm-hmm. or some other miniatures or role playing or card games like Magic the Gathering or something like that. Mm-hmm. And then as adults, they find that this is a social event they can enjoy with other people where they didn't necessarily learn a lot of social skills as as younger people or maybe experienced a little bit of being ostracized as geeks Mm -hmm. as younger people and that being their background they don't want to impose that on others no so they're very welcoming they want they're like i don't want you to feel ostracized about coming when i was to join our game group Mm -hmm. because i was and that was no fun yeah let's change how it's done Right. Yeah. So the culture in, in adult here, board gaming yeah. is actually very welcoming. Mm-hmm. I thought it was very That's nice. not true of everybody, but <laughs> across the board, generally speaking, yeah. it's a very welcoming culture, yeah. inviting. So collection development, mm-hmm. we can move on to that real quickly. Yeah. Board Game Geek is the online Bible for <laughs> board games. That site now has over a million registered users around the world. And it's, it's just this huge community. It's got a database of, I think, closing in on 80,000 games. Uh, the largest gaming event in the world, if you will, at least historically, is the, the Spiel Game Fair in Essen, held every fall in Germany, in Essen, Germany. And the reports last year were that I think there were something like 790 new games being debuted at Essen last year. Too many. It's huge. (laughs) And nobody can play them all. But there's, so that just creates this culture of craving the knowledge. What's coming out? What's new? What can we, you know, what gossip, maybe gossip, but rumors, (laughs) what what preview information can we hear Mm -hmm. about the games that are coming? so that I can sift through that and say which ones do I like, which ones do I want to watch out for. So Board Game Geek is all about that. Any game that you've played probably has an entry there, and there will be a a forum full of posts where people ask questions. Mm -hmm. Like, we got stuck on this rule or this this situation. We didn't know how to resolve it. How did you guys figure it out? Who else has dealt with that? How do you figure it out? And surprisingly, often, especially with these hobby games, it may be the designer himself or herself that comes on and they're answers watching, their question yeah. mm-hmm. because they're involved on the geek as well. Mm-hmm. It's affectionately known as the geek. <laughs> uh, so, I like on board game geek because I use that too, that it gives a really nice for collection development type thing that librarians are working, looking for who are not into this, maybe breakdown of all these different categories where they say, you know, what grade is it for? What level is there expansions? All these real right. details about everything about the game. So you don't have to just go and get it yourself or go and find reviews yourself to figure out. It's got really comprehensive entries on each game with all sorts of right. extra info. Exactly. And there's so many different styles, so many different ages and all mm-hmm. that, that you need a resource like that. To, to be able to sift through them mm-hmm. and figure out what's good. And on the Geek, there's a sub forum for, for games in the classroom. And you'll often find discussions about library use of games as well in there. So yeah, it's a very good resource. Mm-hmm. Two others that I've just put up that are also pretty widely known, uh, the Dice Tower uh, is now a whole network of podcasts, video mm-hmm. reviews, so on. And on their site, you will find a lot of top 10 lists, top 100 lists. So top 10 games to play with your young children or top, I don't know, they have all (laughs) kinds of lists, slice and dice, different ways. But recommendations, it's Mm -hmm. a great source for recommendations and reviews. Mm -hmm. You hear of a game, what is it really like? What does it look like? What's the subject matter? How's it treated? What age group is this Mm -hmm. for? You can get those reviews on Dice Tower. Casual Game Revolution is a fairly new site because it's connected with a very new magazine called Casual Game Insider. Hmm. And the terminology for casual game is basically saying we're not swimming in the deep end of the pool. We are staying with the games at the level of the Spiel des Jahres or games that people can play with their children, games that aren't terribly hard to learn and get into. Hmm. So they... They're all, they're all new games, but they're avoiding the ones that are really the heavy, complex games. Mm-hmm. They're sticking with the ones that are a little bit easier to get into. So that's a good entry point because mm-hmm. they also have reviews, you know, written reviews, um, descriptions and lists and things like that. Another resource to turn to. Yeah. Um, actually, I wanted to go back. I, there's a question here that I should have asked before when you're talking about the game nights you guys do. And I, didn't, I forgot, but I got that's distracted. Okay. <laughs> um, 
how do you advertise the game nights on campus? Okay. To try and get on campus people to. Perfect. Thank you. Um, so I have a set list of things that I do. Board Game Geek was actually the first thing I turned to because in the regional forums, there's a forum for Midwest. So mm -hmm. I, have a, I have a regular mm -hmm. posting in there every month for when our next game night is. Mm -hmm. There is a guild for Lincoln, Lincoln BGGers, mm -hmm. that I always post in. There's a, there's a guild for uh, Central Nebraska that I post in. Now there's an Omaha guild that I also post in yeah. because a few people have come from yeah. Omaha. That is a great way to reach gamers in your region. Mm -hmm. And I like to promote that as a core audience because when they come, they bring games, mm -hmm. they're willing to teach the games, and they keep coming back. Right. So that's a really great resource. Yeah. I also use Facebook on our library Facebook page. Mm -hmm. I post it as an event every month. And then on campus, we have a campus-wide email list for all faculty and staff, so I put it cool. to there. And we have uh, the, the student life office that does a mass email to the student body. Nice. So they pick up on that and they, they send it out to the student body. Mm -hmm. They put it on the student events calendar. Oh, cool. Just library so you game got the, night. the university involved in it yeah. to help out. So, nice. so they're, that, they're supportive that way. Yeah. They're happy. Yeah. The president has gotten responses from students. Our president is very student oriented. He mm -hmm. gets to know them personally. Mm -hmm. And he had one of his presidential scholars, one of the students who got an award scholarship uh, at their dinner when he asked what, now that you're at Concordia for the for your first month, mm -hmm. what have you experienced that you love? And one of them mm -hmm. said, just got to the first game night. It was awesome. I'm looking forward to next month. And nice. so the president had to tell me that yes. um, the next week. And I just, I just glowed. Nice. Yes, <laughs> that was so fun awesome. to hear that. So mm -hmm. he's supportive. Cool. Yeah, that helps. There cool. we go. Great support from your right. administration. Yeah. Oh yeah. Um, I just want to let everyone know we are a little after eleven o'clock. Um, yes, Encompass Live officially goes ten to eleven, but um, we won't get cut off here. Um, we'll go as long as it takes to get through all of Phil's presentation and any questions you guys have. But if you do need to leave because you know you had just blocked out this hour in time, feel free. That's fine. We are recording, and you'll be able to watch the um, anything you missed afterwards. So Great. go ahead. Excellent. Well, some other sources that you can use, that you can turn to. Now, this is a whole list, and I'm not mm -hmm. even going to go through it. But there are umpteen lists, um, podcasts, blogs, YouTube channels, and uh, other sources where people just love to evangelize the new games they've discovered. That's the culture here, is people love to share. So this other site called BoardGameLinks.com is actually a page devoted to what are your favorite websites about board games. Cool. Sliced and diced by different categories, by podcast, by reviews, by game stores, by just general information sites, uh, conventions, and so on. So Board Game Links is a great one to look at to see where can I go to to find information about it. That's, and it, like if you're looking up what are game stores around me, you might find them there, mm -hmm. that sort of thing. Um, there's no end <laughs> of these things. And the podcasts are interesting, too. They're fun to listen to, mm -hmm. uh, opinionated at times. But these sites, mm -hmm. one difference that you'll see between the media that, that reports on video games and the mm -hmm. media that reports on board games is you almost never find them providing game cheats or how to win at such mm -hmm. and such game. Now, those discussions might occur on Board Game Geek. There'll be strategy tips shared mm -hmm. for different games, and that's there. But discovering, taking a new game, exploring its challenges, and discovering what are the ways, the paths that you can take through this game, that's the fun. Mm -hmm. That's the fun of discovering all these new challenges and figuring yeah. them out. So people who are into this gaming culture aren't about the winning. They're about exploring the experience. Mm -hmm. And learning the new game, and yeah. I know some of these, it says you have YouTube channels. There's, I like the ones, there's some that do actual run-throughs of the games to show you yeah. how to play, which has been very useful for some of the more complex ones we've tried at our house, yeah. <laughs> that sometimes we've tried it and we're, and like I said, sometimes because these are independently made, the um, instruction books can be maybe not as clearly written as yeah. you'd like. So then you find some video, not even long ones, not even a whole game, but just here's a 20-minute thing that shows you the basics. And then you figure out, oh, that's what that rule means. Now it makes sense that I right. see someone else doing it. So looking for things like that ahead of time really has helped us too. Yeah. yeah. i got to give a shout-out to the one called Watch It Played. 
Yeah, okay. That's yeah. hosted by Rodney Smith up in Canada, and mm -hmm. that is what he does. Yeah. He will actually be contacted by publishers, and they will oh. say, we're coming out with a new game. Here's a copy of it. Will you? And they will pay him to make a video specifically walking through it. Hmm. And he enlists the eight of his children to play it with nice. him. Yeah. And they will walk it through step by step and say, here's mm -hmm. how you put it out. Here's how you play the game. Mm -hmm. And he's just really good. He's mm -hmm. developed a routine that's that's really good for that. Now, obviously, he hasn't done every game that's out there. No, but okay. but yeah, yeah, watch these different channels. Mm -hmm. Some of the games now are even coming with a uh, QR code on the rule book mm -hmm. that says to see a video on this game. There's scan this. one we were just um, started. We just started with Mice and Mystics uh -huh. that has a mm -hmm. on the front of the um, <clears throat> instruction book. It says go to our website at blah 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 for a video on how how to play video. So the company right. itself had put together a video and we went. Unfortunately, we didn't watch that first, <laughs> so we're gonna go back and start over again. But um, once we watch it, we're like, oh yeah. yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. And that again is how the this gaming hobby industry is evolving. Mm -hmm. They're learning those new techniques to make it more accessible yeah. to people. And they're really getting good at that. And of course, I wouldn't be a, a fair librarian <laughs> without mentioning some of the books that are relevant. These are some of the books we have in our collection. Well, the last one's a DVD, but that I think are good places to start. I mentioned that Freedom the Underground Railroad was by Brian Mayer who's a librarian. And Christopher Harris. And Christopher Harris, exactly, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So they have, have partnered up. In fact, they're the driving force behind that series of books from Rosen that I mm. talked about. Yep. Um, and I got a link to that class. added to the links here. Of, I found their main publisher page with all the five books listed. So. Excellent, excellent. So that top book, Libraries Got Game, is a really good one from ALA on how to use games, in particular with elementary, middle school, and high school age children that give some good examples of how the games will align to actual curriculum points. The teachers have to align their activities in class mm -hmm. to core curriculum standards. And that book actually talks about that. But it also just gives examples of what are good games. So any, any librarian would be, uh, it would do you well to, to look at that and get an idea mm -hmm. what games are good. Um, then the second one is about one of the Rosen books again. Scott Nicholson's book, Everyone Plays at the Library. That's great for everybody, in particular public libraries. It goes into the different types of games, and then it also goes into different types of events and experiences mm -hmm. that tie in with them. And it's not just about board games. It's also about role playing, even video, and, and other sorts of things. So that's a very helpful resource. If you're just interested in what is this board gaming culture, why are adults doing this or whatnot, then the last two items that I have down there are really interesting to reflect on that. Now, they're already about three, four years old, and the information keeps changing. But Euro Games, the book by Stuart Woods, is if you want to read the, the dissertation <laughs> on what is this gaming culture, that's it. It's excellent. And then uh, Lauren Green's uh, Going Cardboard documentary, that's a, just a neat overview hmm. of the gaming culture. You get She interviews a lot of designers, publishers, people who attend game conventions, the founder of Board Game Geek, this kind of stuff, and just lets them tell their story. Um, some of the people involved in it have moved on to new uh, endeavors, uh, different functions within the hobby, and still it's... It, it's just fun to see those people sharing. So I recommend it. And it's actually one of the most popular things out of our collection that gets borrowed by Interlibrary Loan. <laughs> we keep sending it out to other libraries. More people need to get that, obviously. So, yeah. All right. So where to buy them? Right. Now, you won't find them at Walmart. Almost, although a few are starting to sneak into some WalMarts. I've seen. I don't look at Walmart. I've seen at Target. Yes. And, yeah. Ticket to Ride and stuff. Target has yeah, started to Target's carry a them. core number of them. Ticket to Ride is very popular. Pandemic, which is yeah, probably yeah. the poster child for for cooperative games. Mm -hmm. It's an excellent game. Settlers of Catan. You can find a few of those core titles at Target. You can also find a growing number of them at Barnes and Noble. Yeah. Again, depending by the store and location, they adjust their stock. But in those places, you're going to pay list price. Mm -hmm. And for some of these, you know, Ticket to Ride, that's 50 bucks. Yes. Which might seem a lot to pay for a board game. 
Uh, hopefully, when you open it, you'll agree that the components make it worthwhile. But when you go online to specific game shops, Cool Stuff Inc., Miniature Market, Fun Again, there's many of them, but those are three of the top ones. You'll find that same game for $35 mm, instead of $50. Nice. That's significant. So don't be afraid to shop around a little bit. Mm. And Amazon. We've gotten stuff on Amazon. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> and Amazon, you're right. They actually did a thing. At, um, it was International Board Game Day um, mm. last month, the month before, I forget. And they did a whole bunch of things really on sale in, yeah. in conjunction with the International Board Gaming Day. Right. That was that's an event type thing, and um, we picked up a couple there because they were like half price from yeah. the fifty dollar. Yeah. Yeah, I looked at that real fast, mm -hmm. and I had like almost all the ones on the list I know. that I liked. Oh, see, so you already had them. Yeah. So, but yeah, that's a good source to look at. Although I will say these dedicated online game stores across the board have better prices. Amazon. Yeah. Now, many of these stores well, we, also yeah, have a presence Amazon on Amazon. Regular price, if you if it wasn't for that special sale. Yeah. That's well, some of them are. Some of them are still better priced. You yeah. know, well, that's Amazon. You know their thing. <laughs> but uh, I, I do want to give a shout out to friendly local game stores. That's a term mm -hmm. used in the hobby. FLGS. Sometimes with a snicker, because <laughs> some of them are more friendly than others. Yes. Some of them are more or less smelly than others, depending on how many junior high boys come in after school to play mm -hmm. Magic the Gathering or whatnot. So, you know, enter at your own risk. But many of them have learned their lessons and are becoming more family friendly, adult friendly, are clean and, mm -hmm. and well stocked. Uh, some of them, because they have to pay the rent, are, are charging list price. Mm. But some of them have realized now that they can't compete with the online stores at that price, so they're having to discount and still creating a viable market. Mm -hmm. So support your local game store if you feel the desire. Mm -hmm. um, you can also connect with them relative to your events, and you might True. get them to donate like coupons mm -hmm. for your attendees. Just like anybody who, help, who you get to promote, help sponsor an event at your library, they can put their name on, like, sponsored by... Right. So, and so local game shop. Yeah, and your local game shop might give you coupons that say 10% off, and you can put those out at your game night by your sign-in mm -hmm. sheet. And people who go there say, oh, I learned this new game. Maybe they have it over here at such and such game store. So those are the sources that, mm -hmm. that I go to. Cool. And I'm learning new ones all the time. Of course. <laughs> so, Okay, the necessary credits for all my images yeah. and stuff. We don't really have to dwell on that. It's on the recording. And this was kind of what started it a little bit. I did a, li a library or Nebraska libraries article oh, cool. back in February. And that kind of caught some attention, which mm -hmm. is why I've done some of these presentations. Yeah. So you can find some more there about that. Great. So speaking right. of questions. Yes. Do so any does other? anybody have any more questions? Um, I grabbed all the ones that had been asked throughout the show. So um, those have all been done. Um, any, if anybody has any more questions you want to ask Phil, go ahead and get them in right now. Um, I'll let you know while I'm waiting for that. Um, I do have the slides, so I'll be posting that up along with the recording when that's done. And I think I've grabbed all the different links and book links and websites that were mentioned. I'll go through and double check and make okay. sure. So you'll have quick links to all of those as well. We put those into our delicious account on the, for the Library Commission. Maybe while we're listening for questions, mm -hmm. I'll just point out two. I brought a couple of other games. Mm -hmm. I won't go into them in detail, mm -hmm. but this one's fun. It's called The Three Little Pigs. Okay. This publisher, Yellow, starts with an I. Mm -hmm. It's like the word yellow, but with an I, uh -huh. because it's French. So they have to spell uh, things funny. <laughs> Sorry. Um, they have this series called Tales and Games. And mm -hmm. the titles in this series are uh, Baba Yaga, The Three Little Pigs, um, The... I think the ant and the grasshopper is is the newest one. Uh, the hare and the tortoise. Mm -hmm. They look like it little looks like books. A book, yeah. They look like little storybooks on the shelf. The games are designed to be approachable for children. This one is ages seven and up. Mm -hmm. But they're also fun for adults. And a copy of the storybook actually comes with the game. Oh, nice. So if you want to promote the literacy aspect of mm -hmm. connecting with these games or using them as an exploration of that story mm -hmm. after you've read the story. 
you know, you can look into the, the games from yellow. Yeah. Now, I see on here, and this is something I was going to ask about and I just kind of missed. You've got it barcoded and, you know, spine label and everything on there. Mm -hmm. Are Because you just talked about doing the game nights in the library. Are these, these going to be checked out by people if they want to? Good question. <laughs> that's a whole other issue I know that people, libraries are getting into. It is. Yeah. It is. And that's one we've struggled with. Mm -hmm. Some libraries that support school systems mm -hmm. that are getting into games will buy multiple copies of a game to be mm -hmm. used in classrooms and so on. Sure. And they're used to the process of obtaining extra parts, replacements, gonna, things, and things like that. Lost. Things are going to yeah, get that's lost, what I was wondering about. Yeah. ruined, cards will get torn, that sort of thing. We're not at that point yet in our collection. Mm -hmm. I've basically been expanding the collection both to support game night and to provide a broader spectrum of titles for mm -hmm. our ed students to see. Mm -hmm. So we only have one of each. And I'm not too comfortable yet with checking them out. So they're marked non-circulating. Uh, okay. For I've had a couple of occasions where somebody's asked if they could use it for a particular student teaching or, mm -hmm. and I've told faculty members I'd be more than happy for them to check it out, take it to use with their class on campus mm -hmm. if they want to. So I'm open to the idea, but right now the collection itself says non-circulating. Yeah. I override that when I feel it's warranted. Case by case, yeah. yeah. I know that some libraries, public libraries, are circulating them, and that'll be another, that could be a whole other show. How right. how you can actually circulate it? How do you deal with missing pieces, lost pieces, damage, all that? Yeah. Right. There is a conference I'm going to the end of this month on the 31st mm -hmm. down at Mid America Nazarene University mm -hmm. down in uh, outside of Kansas City mm -hmm. in Olathe. It's called, uh, they have a center now called the Center for Games and Learning. Yes. And they are doing a games and learning conference. Mm -hmm. It's a one-day conference on the 31st. She also, she, Lauren Hayes, the um, co-director of the center, also gave a presentation at the spring meeting where I presented uh, this yes, I saw presentation that too, yeah. um, about their center. They are doing multiple copies of things mm -hmm. and, and getting them into classroom use. Uh, their co-director is one of the faculty members for that center. And she gets into their cataloging processes mm -hmm. and general library practices with the games as well. That's actually going to be one of the sessions at the conference there. So if anybody wants to join me down there at the <laughs> conference, I'm going to be going just as an attendee this time that day. So a shout out to, to Lauren and, mm -hmm. and the conference there. I just love this little game um, as an example. It's called Eight Minute Empire. And it has this little board, this little box, these little cubes. I mean, the whole board for this game is you know less than a foot square. Wow. But it's an imaginary world map. It's not our world, but it's an imaginary map of continents and regions, two different maps on the two sides of the board. When you get it out and you start seeing little cubes moving around on a map, you think risk mm -hmm. or you know world domination. And, and that's what you're sort of trying to do in this game, but it's called Eight Minute Empire. Okay, so it's my favorite see. misnomer because it actually <laughs> takes about 15 minutes. I was going to say, is it really? Yeah. But who can imagine a game that's in a tiny little box and a tiny little board that gives you that sense of taking over the world in 15 minutes Nice. And a rule book is, is one piece of paper folded, mm -hmm. so it's it's easy to learn. It's just a great example of how they've taken something and boiled it down to its essence. Mm -hmm. And made it's, it a fun... It is. It's very fun. But learning. <laughs> and, yeah, you you get angst over the decisions <laughs> you have to make. Should I do this or that? And yeah. Which is going to pay out. But in the end, you just do it. Mm -hmm. And in 15 minutes, you're done. And somebody won and... Play again. If it didn't go well, yeah, you try play it again. Try it again. <laughs> so, I just love that example. Yeah. All right. So. No questions came in at the last minute, so I guess we got them all answered. Or wonderful. If you do have other questions, um, Phil's at Concordia. I'm sure he would be happy to answer. Um, Indeed. You can find him there. Um, other than that, so if you don't have any questions, I think we'll wrap it up. Any last right. minute? Uh, keep playing games. Keep playing okay. games. Try them out. And mm -hmm. that's where whenever somebody asks about this and about what we do with game nights, I stress the fact that the culture is one of teaching and learning with so many mm -hmm. new games. Yeah. Because anybody that's new to it, they come in with that fear, oh, I won't know the games. Mm -hmm. That's okay. Because we love to teach them. 
And that's the point. There yeah. was a point when you didn't know how to play Monopoly. You might not remember. <laughs> yeah. But there yeah. was some... And somebody taught you without the book, and they probably taught you wrong. <laughs> House rules. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, don't be afraid. Mm -hmm. And any of you who are listening are welcome to come to game night. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We have a great time. Check out the one out there, the one here, the monthly one here at mm -hmm. Isley and Lincoln. Mm -hmm. Or look, if you're not here, of course, I know many of you are not here in right. Nebraska. Look for them in your local areas, too. Yeah. Yep. Great. Okay. Very good. All right. Thanks a lot, Bill. Thank you, everyone, for attending. Um, that will wrap it up for this week's Encompass Live. Um, it is being recorded and uh, will be available yeah, potentially later today, depending on how long it takes me to get through everything I need to do to get it all together. Um, as I said, there will be the PowerPoint will be available. Um, this is our Encompass Live website. There it goes. Um, on our archive sessions page right here is where it will be posted. Uh, as you can see, what we we list all of our recordings are here, from going back to the very beginning of Encompass Live in January 2009. So you can find everything here, and we will have, just like this was last week's, so we'll have the recording, we'll have the slides, and I've got, um, collect, like I said, I've captured just all the links that I could um, that will be available for you there as well. So um, everyone who attended, you'll get an email letting you know when the recording is ready for you to go look at and share. Um, so that will wrap it up for this week. I hope you'll join us next week when our topic is Managing the Device Deluge, Training and Supporting Staff. Um, we will have Jennifer Korber, who is at uh, Boston Public Library. Uh, she's a public instruction curriculum development coordinator. Wow, what a title. Um, but she has um, information about how to get your staff trained in all these new devices and technology and things that are they're coming into your library anyways. So um, ways to help you train your staff to be able to deal with this technology. So I hope you'll join us next week for that um, and for any of our other shows that we've got coming up here. Um, you can see this. We only have a couple of shows listed on the schedule right now. I've got a... Um, discussions and works for other ones so there will be things filling in so keep checking back to our website to see what new topics um, are coming up. Also Encompass Live is on Facebook so if you are a big Facebook user please do go ahead and like us over there you'll get notifications when the recordings are available I also let people know here um, people can log in on the fly every Wednesday morning so I let you know when the show is about ready to start as I did for um, today's show um, so to get all your updates um, on Facebook. So if you're big on Facebook, go ahead and like us there. Other than that, that wraps it up for this morning. Thank you very much, Phil. Thank, Thank you, everyone, for attending. And we'll see you next time on Encompass Live. Bye-bye.